and there were these big collapse pits and billions and billions of microbes streaming from the sea floor. And I still remember that. Just we could have, I could have watched it for days. They'd never been filmed. They've only been seen a few times. It was a, it was a pretty profound moment. It's again why the Cable Observatory is so important. So I'm Debbie Kelly. I'm the director and PI, principal investigator of the Regional Cable Array, which is uh, a NSF, National Science Foundation program that helped install the largest underwater cable observatory in the US. So the Regional Cable Array is an underwater observatory. It basically brings the power and the internet into the oceans for the first time uh, within the US. And it extends over 300 miles offshore Oregon uh, it extends out to the largest and most active underwater volcano off our coast called Axial Seamount, uh, and it all, which has erupted in 1998, 2011, and 2015, and is uh, poised to erupt soon. One of the other main focuses of the cable array is um, Cascadia Margin, it's one of the most biologically productive areas of water in the world's oceans, and so it's also very strongly impacted by ocean acidification, anoxia events. Uh, harmful algal blooms, and so we have a, an array of instrumentation and moorings out there that bring in data in real time to study those processes. Um, those kinds of processes operate throughout the world's oceans, but they're really exemplified off our, off our margin. NOAA had a long-term observatory there of uncabled instruments. It's a highly active volcano. It has active hydrothermal vents there and lower temperature methane seep sites. It's one of the few places in the world's oceans that has had uh, long-term time series measurements of the microbes that live within the seafloor and the vents there. Uh, in total, there's over, over 900 kilometers of fiber optic cable that produces 8,000 watts of power, so a lot of power for instruments. We have uh, over 150 instruments on the array right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of them are streaming basically as fast as they can data to their maximum uh, capability on the shore, and all the data are open to everybody. A lot of the major processes that happen in the oceans, we're never there in the right place at the right time, or we are there, but it's blowing 80 knots, and um, in those kinds of wind conditions and 30-foot waves, you're not getting a lot of work done. So uh, one of the main drivers for the observatory was to have a 24-7 presence around the clock for 25 years to be able to be in the right place and also to have two-way communication from shore so that when events happen, we can respond in different ways to those events. Well, I, I found it, I found it difficult, um, again and again and again, to be just on the verge of, be getting to understand what I was seeing. I thought, I thought, it, then it became clear th that every time we come back, these systems look different. Uh, one of the things that frustrated me was not knowing how things changed through time, specifically. Uh, in a particular location when it was a complicated system like a submarine hydrothermal system, or for that matter, any ecosystem that is not at the surface of the ocean but is below the surface. It's hard to stay with it. It's hard to map it. And so that was when the idea of the fiber optic cable with its high bandwidth became attractive to me and to others. And so a colleague of mine, uh, Alan Che from Woods Hole Oceanographic, the American Geophysical Union meeting in 1991, and Alan was listening to me uh, grouse about this, and he said, well, you know, there's a new technology of fiber optic cables that are stretched across the sea floor, and they have high bandwidth. It might be possible to get a used one and maybe figure out a way to have data come from the seafloor. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. By 2014, we had finished the project, and I'm very happy to say that it is up and running well. Uh, my colleague, Deborah Kelly, is principal investigator now. She was part of the team that, that helped put the thing in place. So I, I first started working with John in 1980, 
I was a very shy undergrad and I needed, really needed a job to put myself through school. And so he asked if I would work with him. And the first summer we went out to sea and I just fell in love with everything about the oceans. Um, pretty much from 2005 onward, uh, in, in addition to my other research, I've been focused on getting the cable array in place and now operating and maintaining it. John had that vision and for 10, 15 years, 15 years at least I think now, um, made sure that, uh, yeah, that that project was successful. John was, is uh, still a mentor to me in some ways. Um, he's absolutely a visionary uh, and has changed the way that we look at the oceans forever. Historically, we've been incredibly sensor poor in the oceans, and so a lot of the fundamental processes that are ongoing in the oceans were never there at the right time. So the Cable Observatory was designed um, to answer key scientific problems, and then we spent years working on the engineering requirements for that. Um, so the array itself is a combination of industry-provided materials. There's a large, we call it the backbone cable, which, so it provides the main power for the spider array of instruments and cables that are on the seafloor. Uh, there's big, uh, we call them primary nodes, they're big substations on the seafloor, and they provide the main power, and then we have 33,000 meters of extension cables that go out to the key experimental sites, of which there's five or six now. Uh, several of them are focused on the margin and then at the base and the summit of axial seamount. When, when a volcano is evolving and ready to erupt or erupting, how does that impact the hydrothermal vents, fluids coming out of the seafloor, and what, are the, what does that do to the chemistry of the fluids, the heat coming out of the seafloor, and then the life that's associated with that? Now we have about 51 principal investigators and co-PIs involved. Uh, with, that have added instrumentation onto the cable array. Right now we have projects funded from Germany, a long-term project at a methane seep site. Big NASA program funded to, uh, it's a part of exobiology out of NASA to detect life on other planets. Other instruments we have out there are seismometers that measure when melt migrates around in the subsurface, the seafloor cracks and causes small earthquakes that you can't detect on land. And so this is one of the outstanding parts of this, com this observatory is, it really is the most advanced volcanic observatory in the world's oceans right now. For example, in 2015, when the volcano last, last erupted, in over 24 hours, there was over 8,000 earthquakes in 24 hours and the seafloor dropped over seven feet and we were able to measure that in real time. The, you can imagine a, a ocean connected by the internet and I think that's going to be what we need to understand the planet better. And one of the great things about the NSF program, OOI, is that everybody has access, a global community has access to those data and so I think it does, having those new eyes People that think in very different ways and look at things differently, right? I think um, to me that's one of the things I'm most excited about. Over the next 20 to 50 years, I think this is one of the paths that oceanography will be going on, and a very exciting one, I might add. And that's what oceanography is about: is is understanding this basic global scale life support system that that we we all depend upon. Huge discoveries on the on the forefront. Yeah, they're coming. So, yeah, so exciting. Yeah, it is. It's a good time to to play. <laughs>